hundred number call in. I'm not sure what it is. Um, I think Eric Greedy struck the right balance between presentation formal. There we are. Uh, hey, eight hundred number. Tell us who you are in the chat. I never know who you are. Hey, John, welcome. Uh, jo- Jonna, hey, how's it going? Do you know Jonna Burke? Uh, no, I don't think we no. know. Cool. We have Terry. Welcome back, Terry. Good to see you. Uh, let's see if I have a comment from the 1-800 number. I do not, so I don't know who they are. Uh, but let's just jump right into this and get started, shall we? Our guest today is Tim Ash, CEO of TimAsh.com. He is a conversion optimization expert and the author of Unleash Your Primal Brain, Demystifying How We Think and Why We Act. <laughs> He's keynoted events all over the world for Google, Facebook, PubCon, and others, and I'm delighted to have him with us. Tim, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Very happy to be with you. Tim, why does evolutionary psychology matter to digital marketers? Wow. Well, I think it should matter to all people. If you want to understand the basic operating system for human beings, it's how your brain works. And to understand that, you need to understand the whole arc of evolution that led us up to who we are. But for marketers in particular, I think a lot of marketers are focused on the technology. You know, it's Twitter this, it's Oculus headsets, it's, I don't know, it's hologram suppositories tomorrow. I don't know what the technology is going to be, but the thing we're trying to influence is the human brain. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings. In fact, I spend most of my time myth busting about how the brain really works. So if you want to have a durable career as a digital marketer, you need to understand what you're trying to influence. And and what is social reasoning and how does it play into conversion optimization? Well, uh, this is work uh, that was pioneered by Dr. Robert Cialdini. Uh, He's one of the masters of persuasion. He's got a book called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And he basically has shown through a lot of social science and selling and marketing experiments that human beings are very much influenced by others. Uh, we're, I have a whole section in my book called Hypersocial. We are the most social of all mammals by far. And uh, so we're influenced uh, by the culture around us, by other people's behavior. We look for social norms. And so it's actually fairly easy to manipulate us by putting us in the right social situations. So you developed this framework to unify branding with direct response marketing. Talk to us about how you resolve the tension between those two approaches. Mm, Well, usually there's a war within most companies. There's the branding, I'll call them Nazis. You know, it's like, here's our brand guidelines. You must use this font and it has to be this color and all of this stuff, right? And we have to use this brand voice. and it's all in a book somewhere. And the uh, direct response guys are out there. It's like, hey, as long as it makes a buck, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever it takes. You know, it's the three easy payments of $9.99 plus shipping and handling. You know, that's the direct response guys. And usually they're just talking past each other at a company. And what I've actually found is that the brand does matter, but the brand is kind of the frame in which we experience the immediate offer. So there was this old uh, commercial TV commercials for Folgers Instant Crystals. I mean, awful instant coffee, right? But they say, we secretly swapped out the coffee at this fine restaurant, like Tavern on the Green in New York. Let's listen into what people are saying. And then they go, oh, this is wonderful coffee and all that. Well, the coffee wasn't the good thing. It was the frame of being at Tavern on the Green as a restaurant and that luxury experience. So the brand serves as the frame in which our offer is going to be valued. And that's really where the two get unified. In his book, How to Prepare for Climate Change, New York Times bestselling author David Pogue writes a survival guide on how to deal with everything from hurricanes and droughts and floods to societal breakdown. Is there anything you know about our brain chemistry that could help policymakers and public affairs communicators find bipartisan support for U.S. climate action policy? Wow, Uh, that's a tall order and obviously the existential question uh, for the whole planet right now. Um, The one thing that I would say is that the, the insight that I've gotten is partly out of writing this book is that we're built for tribal survival, not individual survival. So our allegiance is to having cohesive cultural tribes. 
And in order to, to have a cohesive tribe, you have to spread in a completely unchanged way anything that your tribe is telling you to spread. If you're the sand in the gears, you'll get thrown out or ostracized. You have to just parrot whatever your tribe says. And in times of uncertainty, especially, we fall back on this cultural and tribal knowledge, even at the expense of our direct experience. So um, you have to make sure that you penetrate whatever tribes you're trying to influence and speak in terms of their values and present this, not in a generic, you should save the world and everybody should be on board with it way, but something that ties into their cultural transmission inside the tribe. So you basically have to personalize it down to each tribe to be effective. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. You know, I was speaking to Michael Mann. He's an atmospheric scientist about the tribalism behind climate change denial, where if you want to be a good member of the conservative tribe, you're told that you have to deny climate change. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how you might be able to sort of win support within the conservative community for climate action policy. Well, let's talk about values, because the same story, the same objective reality is going to be experienced very differently in terms of, uh, you know, your belief systems, right? So if we think about what is the values that are held by conservatives, it could be, it's, they're, they're often much more local. So for example, it's my town, it's my uh, religious organization, my church, my baseball team, you know, in the U.S., you know, my uh, Friday night football in Texas, at the high school level, whatever that local community is. And again, I think it's, uh, if, if you understand what those values are, then you can start talking about it in terms of local impacts, for example. Not saying like, you know, people in Africa are going to be dying because there's droughts over there. You know, frankly, I don't care what's happening in my community. So if you understand that they care about local stuff, you could pitch that in terms of the local changes. Uh, won't take much convincing to tell Texans that heat waves and cold snaps are bad and the extremes of weather are going to affect your society. So it's better to prepare or prevent. Um, so again, it's, a, it's understanding their local values. So I'm going to kind of talk to you about sort of big picture uh, ideas, but then I also do want to drill down and talk a little bit about landing page optimization because I know that's something that you're you know a thing or two about. Yeah, I've written a couple of books on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so talk to us first just about some evergreen strategies that you've used for conversion optimization that seem to you know withstand the test of time. Well, I think it's more of a philosophy I'll start with rather than than even the strategies. And the problem with marketers is that we basically say, we have a product, the whole world needs to know about it and everybody should buy it. And it's this megaphone inside out from our company out to the world, trying to create enough noise and be heard. When in reality, the most effective way to market is to understand, well, going back to the tribal idea, understand a very specific audience, zero in, say, what's my focus? And then understand what their values are and then design products and services and messaging that's going to be appealing to them. So we have to start outside in, if you will. Uh, I was very much influenced by a professor of mine, Don Norman at UC San Diego. He was the one back in the 80s came up with the idea of user-centered design. There is no objectively best design. The only question is, is it fit for a particular purpose? Does it satisfy the needs of the intended users? And so, again, for me, everything starts and ends with understanding your, your users. But when, when you're, if, if you were retained by a company to sort of come in and look at their landing pages, mm -hmm. is there sort of like, you know, a list of things you would run through? Oh, yeah. To sure that they're, you know. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole chapter right. in my landing page optimization book. I call it the seven deadly sins of landing pages. These are very common, endemic, I would say issues that most websites and landing pages have. Uh, lack of trust is one. We're just assuming that they're ready to buy from us today. No, you need all kinds of uh, social proof in the form of testimonials, outside authority, for example, uh, media mentions and, uh, and public relations type of stuff, as well as the production quality of your site. It's got to pass the smell test. And we make that initial first impression very quickly and if in a 20th of a second, in fact, and we know whether a site is cheesy or professional. So uh, trust is a huge one. 
Another one is we have way too much text, way too much text on our pages. It's been shown over and over that if you cut back the amount of text, and I would add, take out every single adjective on the page that you can't objectively substantiate because that makes us just waste time trying to discredit the marketing bullshit that you're writing. You're just objective and terse and well-organized information. You're going to have much higher conversion rates. Another thing is keep your promises. People don't just end up on our website from nowhere. They came from somewhere. It was a, a link. It was this podcast they're listening to right now. Any number of things. So if we, you make a promise upstream, make sure there's a clean and clear information sent and that you keep that promise on your landing pages and on your website. So those are some of the, the more obvious ones, I would say. So let's talk for, about them for a second. So on the cheese factor, what are like when you're sort of scrubbing for cheese factor, what are you looking for? What are the signals that say cheese? Well, I think that this also goes to visual presentation in general. And our pages are just too loud. In other words, it's one thing if you're out there somewhere trying to attract my attention to be obnoxious and interrupt me and get my attention. And then, but when I come to your page, it shouldn't be this Turkish bazaar of everyone competing for my attention. What you should have is a Zen-like stillness on your page out of which the call to action just naturally arises. It just needs a little more contrast than the rest of the page. In other words, the recipe is be bland and boring and very deliberately mess with the visual hierarchy on the page to support your conversion goals. And instead, we just over-decorate. We have background videos and really loud graphics and giant 196-point font headlines, and everything is screaming and competing for my attention. So if we don't know what's important, then the people visiting don't either. So one of my number one things is keep your graphic designers on a really short leash. I'm sorry that fine art career didn't work out and you have to design another boring button that says download the white paper, but just stay inside the box and don't get obnoxious with the visuals. And that especially is important not to have anything motion based on the page. I don't care if it's a slider, it's a background video, it's one of those obnoxious uh, social media feeds like deep, there's another tweet, deep, there's another tweet. Any motion on the page is going to hijack attention. We can't, from an evolutionary standpoint, ignore something moving in our visual field. That's why grandma died because the bear caught her and killed her, right? You can't ignore motion. Do you have any sort of ratio or, or guide for how to determine how much text is too much text? Uh, well, uh, I, like I said, the less is more. Uh, Jacob Nielsen from Nielsen Norman Group has done all kinds of research on this going back. I've had him on years. the show before. Yeah. 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 And yeah, he keynoted my conversion conference back in the day. Yeah. And it hasn't changed. Just less is more. So it's kind of like they asked Mark Twain once to do some kind of presentation. He said, how long is the speech need to be? And they said, well, why does that matter? And he said, well, if it's an hour long presentation, I'm ready to go right now. If it's a half hour, I need a week to prepare. And if it's a five minute speech, then I'm going to need a month. So take the time, edit it down to the essential. Every word matters. And even more, the absence of words matters if you finally hone what's left. What's your thought on uh, stock photos with respect to cheese factor and trust? Well, I mean, we worked with uh, Shutterstock, so I, I have plenty to say about stock photos. If you're using them to decorate, it's a problem. If it's the same, you know, people holding hands and shaking hands or, or happy people looking at a laptop around a conference room table, I mean, that, I call that business porn, you know, and you shouldn't use it at all, ever. Uh, so the thing that you should do with your pictures is manipulate attention. So unless it's specifically supporting an, an intended call to action on the page, it should probably not be there. I don't care how boring your page would be without it. Take it off. It's just that simple. What's, one of the things I personally, when I go to evaluate the trustworthiness the worthiness of a website is I typically go to the about us page. Mm. And I look, kind of look at that and do I see people's names and do I see pictures of people that work there? Yeah. If I don't see pictures of people that work there, 
I, I'm usually really reticent. Any thoughts around that sort of the about yeah. us section in the bio pages? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, it shouldn't be buried in the about us page. Many companies make the mistake of not elevating that origin myth, uh, the people that are out front to the homepage. I think that's where it often belongs. If you bury it in about us, especially if you're talking about any kind of professional services, I don't care if you're an architect, a lawyer, digital marketing firm, the first thing they're buying is the promise that you're going to do something useful for them. So they need to buy you. So it's not about us. It's like, meet our team. These are the people that are going to actually be doing what you're paying us for. So uh, maybe it's different for product companies, but certainly, like I said, for any kind of professional services or even plumbing or, you know, or pipes burst. Okay. Well, who's going to come fix them? Well, it's Fred. Here's all about Fred. And so you should lead with that. You should have pictures of your whole staff and support network and your, your mascot dog and everybody else that's involved in the company. So you mentioned, uh, you know, one, one of these other things that you do is make sure that you keep your promises, which I interpret to mean, you know, be consistent in your message. You know, if you've got a pay-per-click ad that promises something and they click through, make sure you repeat that message on the landing page that they're going to. Yes. Information sent has to be maintained. If you say, um, you know, sign up for consumer reports and um, you'll get access to reviews and then you get to a page that basically has a, a, a paywall and you're making me pay to get the reviews. Well, you just lied to me. You should give me some sample of the reviews or something like that, or last year's model, something that, that has continuity with your promise, which is I get access to reviews. Right, right. Makes perfect sense. But like you've worked with some huge clients like American Express and Costco, you know, the biggest of the big. So I, you got to think an, an organization like that is, are, is probably running a massive campaign with, um, you know, using all sorts of traffic sources and channels to try to bring people to a portfolio of different landing pages. So talk to us just sort of practically, like well, you know, it, boots it, on the ground about how you manage that and make sure you keep the marketing at the paid message consistent with the landing page when you're working with so many channels and so many landing pages. Well, I think they has to be subject matter based and promise based. So, um, and there's also, well, before I go into that, there, there's a threshold below which it's not worth customizing stuff, right? So there's always the rule of 80-20. 20% 20 of your landing pages are going to represent 80% of your traffic that you're directing, right? So at some point, if you're going to, for example, localize a website, well, do English, do Spanish, do Mandarin Chinese. It's probably not worth doing Danish. Sorry to all my Danish friends. There's just 10 million Danes in the world. So at some point, you just say en enough is enough. I'm not going to personalize down to a certain level, but you should be customizing for your big stuff. That's my point. So always attack the highest value, highest volume, highest transaction pages and campaigns first, but make sure that those are fine tuned because that's where the, the value is. So I want you to critique a bare bones landing page. Uh, that I have That's set okay. up. So I'm going to share it with you. I'll bring it on the screen here. And, uh, you know, obviously this is just bare bones. And what this is, is a landing page for a winery that mm. has a, an email marketing list. And if you sign up to their list, they're going to give you three bottles, free shipping on three bottles or more. Um, so what would you do? Rip, rip this apart and tell me how you, how you would improve this. Well, well, it's hard to rip apart since there's nothing to rip. It's basically a blank page. Okay. So one thing you told me, the purpose of this page was what? The purpose of this page was to get me to give up my email, right? To sign up for a newsletter in effect. And That's then, right. But, but you're talking about, from a messaging standpoint, free shipping on three bottles of more. Sounds like I have to buy something. Get a coupon code. Again, that has nothing to do with anything related to signing up for a newsletter. Submit is just about the most horrible thing you could put on a button unless you're a dominatrix. It means nothing to anybody. Submit. Well, that's what happens mechanically when you press a button. You're going to submit the form contents, but that's so nerdy and so 1995, right? The word submit should be banned on all buttons, by the way. The, any button should say, should complete something that's in my self-interest. I want to dot, dot, dot. The, that's what gets put on the button. I want to sign up for the free newsletter. I want to get my discount code. I want to get my free uh, shipping. 
So that's what should be on the button. In general, land, direct response landing pages like this, uh, I talk about the Holy Trinity, and this is not a religious concept, but if you look at any direct response page, it should have a headline, a form subheadline, and the button. And it should be read as a kind of a funnel and a hierarchy in that order. So what's the page about? What are you asking me to do in this form? And what's my motivation for doing it? What actually happens when I press that button? That's the Holy Trinity. So I would say, um, you know, become an instant wine expert and get discounts on future products by, okay, sign up for our mailing list. Um, and then you have the, enter your email here. It's like, okay, um, get my weekly tips and discounts, something like that. So basically the whole thing has to be in alignment from purpose of the page. What are you asking me to do in the forum? And what's my payoff? What happens when I push that button? To me, that's kind of the, the skeleton of a correct direct response landing page. What sort of image? How do you pick the right image for a page like this? Well, what's the, what's the focus here? This looks like e-commerce or that we sell uh, highly rated bottles of wine because they have medallions on them. That's the image you currently have. Right. And to me, everything is, you know, have you, have you ever tuned to Wiffham Radio? What's in it for me? What's I know. In I it never for me? Should I? Yeah. That's the only one we ever tune into. That's the only radio station playing. It's not Clubhouse. It's not this podcast. It's what's in it for me radio, Wiffham Radio. So again, turn this from an outside, inside out, like I'm going to tell you something to an outside in. What do I get out of it? So the psychology of it has to be for me, okay? And so if I want to be like the, if your newsletter is promising me that uh, I'll be an expert on wine, then it's like, have, have that, like the, that snooty top hatted guy with the champagne flute, you know, like holding court with people listening around them, right? That's what I become then if I get your newsletter. So it's all about me. What about the, um, the menu or, you know, other links or the, um, the, uh, the hello bar at the top? What, what about that stuff? I mean, should that stuff be there or not? Oh, well, it depends. If, it depends on the circumstances. If you want me to navigate around the site, that's fine. If you're in some kind of sign-up flow or process or the checkout where you're asking me to give you money right now, please get rid of the menu or, or the top nav and the ability to go anywhere else because I'm kind of in the torpedo tube. There's only one way out. <laughs> Interesting. So with something like a landing page that's informational like this, email sign up, you're okay having the, the menu there. It's just in the checkout that you, you wouldn't want the menu. Yeah. I would say that, again, if you, if you have me in a linear task, you, I should be able to back out of it. I should be able to go back to previous steps, but I shouldn't be able to just go into the weeds and, and start doing something else in the middle of it. So if I was your, if I worked for you and I was your web designer and this is now your account and you've got to fix this page, what instructions are you going to give me now so that I can pick, pick, pick give me, let's role play it. Give me the instructions of what to do to fix it. Okay. Keep it relatively bland. Focus it on the visitor. Make sure there's a clear value proposition. So a lot of times when you have a direct response page, it's the newsletter sign up in this case, right? What do I get if I sign up for this newsletter? You should be selling me on the newsletter sign up. Expert knowledge only takes two minutes, you know, we say once a week, uh, discounts and special pre-sales that you're invited to as our VIP member. All of, so you're selling the sign up. And then just if you have a download or a guide or even a video you want me to watch, the page for that should be selling that. What is what do I get out of it by even taking your free sign up or something like that? We have a question from uh, Adrian uh, Sasena. Uh, Adrian, I'm going to promote you to a panel so that you can ask the question yourself. So I'll just bring her on screen here for a second. And um, maybe while that's loading, um, what have you learned about how evolutionary psychology impacts sales online? Uh, well, everything is evolutionary psychology. Like I said, it's the basic operating system for human beings. So if you want to persuade people and convince them, uh, what, you have to understand basic mechanisms. So 
in my book, I talk about what all 8 billion of us on the planet have in common. It's not about whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or your race or your socioeconomic class or background. It's the universal. And one of the things that most salespeople don't understand is that the brain is there to conserve energy. It already burns so much energy, about a quarter of our resting calories every day, that its default is to do nothing. And so the first thing you have to overcome is not your competitor. You have to overcome my uh, inertia of doing nothing. And, and we can talk about how to do that. Hey, Adrian. Hey, Adrian, what's happening? What's your question? I think he's uh, muted or not on the. Zoom yeah, he, part, he, but... he's going to unmute, though. Now he's in the car. What's happening, man? Don't crash. <laughs> Can't hear him. Can't hear um, you, man. Can't hear you. You got to unmute. You got to unmute. We don't hear you. Oh, I think we right. lost him. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully as, he'll be as back. they say in the news, uh, we're having some technical, technical difficulties. difficulties. Let's get it's on true. that and see if we can fix that. Uh, let me just make him a attendee again. Um, okay. So you write about this concept of concentric circles representing the different tribes that we're members of. And you also say that conservatives tend to identify with more immediate circles like the family or the religious group, while progressives tend to identify with broader circles like the human species or even animal rights activists. All yeah, ac actually, I, I didn't write about that. I, I talked about it, I believe, uh, on a couple of occasions in the past, but that's not in the book. But that's thanks for the clarification. Yeah, yeah. But you, you spoke about it in an interview I heard. So I, I assumed you wrote about it. But thank you for correcting me. What what would you say? to a brand that feels strongly that they want to support an oppositional position, which could split their market, at least ideolog ideologically against them. Well, I think that the biggest issue that any brand has is, is relevance and being heard above the noise. And so if you look at it that way, if you, you haven't landed on a bullseye for your target audience, they don't care about you. They're, you're just like uh, something that goes back, goes along in the 5,000 marketing impressions I'm going to get today and I'm just going to tune it out. So it has to be uh, like a, a, a hell yes or no. Those are the only responses that I have. If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. So I'm not going to do anything with your brand. So how do you get to a hell yes? You get there by having such a strong resonance that it's, it's super relevant on point focused for a small segment. You can't say everybody in the world should buy this. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. You can't, you have, you have to be focused down and really, really understand your audience. And so that their reaction to you is, wow, where have you been all my life? This is perfect. How could I have lived without this? I'm so glad I ran across this. I mean, I'm sure you've had those kind of rare instances where that happens as a marketer, right? Or as a consumer rather. And you go, this is amazing. How come I never heard about this? That's the reaction you want to have. And in order to do that, you have to have a point of view. You have to stand for something. And by extension, you have to say no to a lot of other things. We do not want you as a customer if the following. Um, if you want to make this the year, you get good at lead generation. Download my new white paper on the 10 essential digital marketing skills to master. Digital marketing is a broad discipline, and the white paper gives you an overview of the most important skills to develop in order of importance, and you can download it at ericschwartzman.com forward slash essential skills. Tim, why is it that some content, marketing, some content marketing strategies work while others fail? What's the winning difference in the content marketing equation? So again, focus, I can't say it enough. I'll say it three times, actually. Focus, focus, focus. Understand your target audience. The next thing you have to do is uh, what are their values? A lot of times we look at it as like, what's their relationship to us? Will they buy our stuff? Well, that's not where my center of gravity is. So you have to understand my whole life, where my center of gravity is and how you fit into that. Then you'll understand the things that are influencing me regarding things like you offer. And that's where the content gets built in, in these pre-existing influencing um, ways. 
So I'm already embedded in places I'm getting my news, who I'm talking to, what activities I'm doing. So you have to kind of insert yourself where I live instead of trying to drum up a new channel or um, build a new community. That's super hard, but you can certainly identify communities that I'm loyal to or that are at least a target rich environment for you. So that's another observation. And finally, the mistake that most content marketers make is they're too transactional. They want to uh, practice what I call greedy marketer syndrome. It's where you squeeze the bottom of the sales funnel and hope money comes out. No, you should actually align things with the whole customer journey. You should have content that slides me down the funnel. But even if it's early stage and you can't make money off of me, you should still be giving me the gift of good content, how to frame the decision. Why is it important? What are my choices? That's even before you get to talk about your service products, how much they cost and all the features of them. So all the content marketing I'm seeing is focused at the very bottom of the funnel. And that's a huge mistake because if you get my attention and the right to communicate with me early in the process, that's like a judo move. You just took the legs out from all of your competitors that are still doing radio commercials for mattresses, hoping I'm in the ma mattress <laughs> buying mood today. Hey, I, we have a question from Laura Martin. She asks, um, what are the most typical hurdles you have to overcome when you work with your largest clients? Mm. One of the biggest is, uh, you know, we talked about this difference between direct response and branding is that they're brand guardians and companies, and they're usually very conservative. Like I said, you can't change that font. This logo must be at least 10 pixels away from the white space or those kind of just really kind of a anal retentive, for lack of a better word, rules. And so one of the things you have to do is get a champion inside the company that's going to allow you the air cover to take some risks. In other words, there's, there's top down. Yeah, we have to have consistency for our campaigns and brands, but you also have to have some innovation where there's bottom up stuff coming in and saying, hey, this is what really works in the field. Maybe we should incorporate that back into our brand. So a lot of companies only have the top down control based kind of stuff. And frankly, it's very hard to work with companies like that. So you need uh, somebody that lets you go off the, the reservation and try stuff that's, you know, riskier and you need political air cover for that. So you need a champion at a company that's not risk averse. That's the basic number one success factor we found yeah, in big companies. Yeah, totally. Good, good point. Hey, Terry Kelman has a question. He asks, uh, do politically flavored campaigns help sales or just tint the brand. And, you know, I, I'd like to widen that out a little bit because, you know, I don't really see many politically uh, tinged campaigns, but I do see a lot of cause socially, socially, social cause related campaigns. So let's broaden it out to, to en encompass that as well. Anything that's sort of taking a position, a political position or a social position, um, you know, is that dangerous or is it the right way to go? I mean, we're, we're sort of getting mismatches. Be qualified for a second. So um, last quarter, we had a panel of social media experts on talking about a report from Talkwalker, uh, which is a sponsor of the show. And um, they had done a report on sort of what consumers want. They say they want from brands. And one of the trends was, you know, consumers want brands to take a, pos a social position and to take a stand on, on social issues. But, you know, the panel was mixed. The panel was like, well, do clients, do, do customers really want us to take an issue or do they want us to take their issue? So, you know, take their side. What's, what's your sense on this? I mean, and let me just say, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A, is a, you know, very right-wing conservative organization, but they make a hell of a sandwich. So I go there all the time. It doesn't align with my politics, but that doesn't bother me. I'll still go buy the sandwich. It's a terrific sandwich. So what's, what is your thought on that? Mm, uh, great question. I think that um, point of view and a stance is important. You have to be for something and against something as a brand. If you're milk toast and you're in the middle, you're going to get clobbered. Before we used to have the idea of a bell curve, right? Where the, the hump is in the middle, the kind of regular normal distribution. Now we have kind of an inverse bell curve. There's two extremes and there's nothing in the middle. So you can't be Sears, which is why Sears went out of business. They were in the middle. You either have to be Walmart and super cheap 
or you have to be ultra premium and um, and that's it. So I think as a brand, you can position yourself as a low cost leader or as you have to, well, you have to stake out an extreme position. Domino's, okay, it's not good quality pizza, but it'll be there in 30 minutes or less. Their position is speed. It's an extreme Dude, I position. love Domino's. Okay, I well, enjoy. Domino's. Okay. My wife hates it. Yeah. She gets mad at me when I order it. I love Domino's. I can't okay. eat it because it's <laughs> fattening, but I love it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, my, my point was there. that you can't be everything to everybody. And that's that's what most brands get wrong. You stretch a brand too far and it's like jam on toast. You know, you can't even taste it anymore if you spread it too thin. So you have to stand for something. And again, by extension, you have to stand against other things. And so I think it is important for brands to take a position that are in alignment with the values of their target cultural tribe. And that's the key. So it's not just, you know, we're just going to pop off on anything political. It's, um, you know, for example, we're a software company, like um, say Facebook themselves, right? If you're not, you have a bunch of young engineers and young people in general working there, they tend to be more progressive. Uh, They tend to be more universalist. Right. So to saying you're going to support, let's say, something like uh, uh, Black Lives Matter or or um, rights of minorities in general, they're coming from that uh, world where they're sitting next to you know, engineers. Well, people like me that might have come from the former Soviet Union or India or China, they already live in a United Nations kind of environment, if you will. They're not probably in some small town if you're working for Facebook. So you have to know what your both your target audience and your employees stand for. And a lot of this activism is coming from the employees because you, the organization has to be something that they're proud of. So if you want productivity from your employees, that's also an important consideration in your brand positioning. You brought up uh, you know, the, the issue of uh, you know, tribalism earlier and, and just now, I think alluded to, the, you know, to racism a bit. Is there a connection there? Are we genetically predisposed as tribal creatures to segregation and and racism? The short answer is yes. Uh, Most people don't want to hear that, but here's the reality is as mammals, we we have the advantage of being in a herd, right? We're weaker than individuals. uh, Like, for example, an alligator does fine just by itself. It hatches out of an egg, it grows up and starts eating everything around it. But as herd animals, as mammals, we need the protection of the herd. And normally, if you look at human evolution, our herd was a few dozen people, 100 to 200 at most, that we had a personal relationship with. Moreover, we had a genetic relationship with. Everybody was some vague combination with uncertain paternity of uncle, father, cousin, nephew. And so we had a reason to protect our tribe because that carried our genetic information inside of it. So I would sacrifice myself as an individual because you're my brother or sister. The problem is, is that we also learn to be culturally tribal. So we have chosen cultural identities. I'm the Mercedes driving tribe. You're the Apple phone tribe. Um, And we divide into these tribes almost instantly over the smallest trivial differences. And then they harden because we need to be cohesive within our tribe into really, really painful things. So we were designed to be in a tribe of 100 to 200, occasionally see other tribes that size. We were not designed for these overlapping identities and some of these tribes involving millions or even billions of people. That's where it starts to misfire. But yeah, we were very tribal and uh, we stick with our tribe and we override, like I said, our individual needs in the name of the tribe even. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Tony Reese, the uh, uh, executive director of Edelman, the global PR firm, mm-hmm. on to talk about the Trust Barometer report, which is now in its, I think, 21st year. It's a report about what we find trustworthy, what people see as trustworthy. And she says, you know, the findings of the most recent report are that we're not just experiencing a pandemic, but we're actually in an infodemic as well. Uh, When you think about how social algorithms are designed to extend session time or watch time by giving us more of the same, and that we're genetically predisposed to tribalism, 
Do you see a way out of this environment that we're in right now? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there's, of course, the, the social dilemma. Yeah, you might have seen that documentary. And we, in online marketing, we're all aware of the, the negative effects of social media. And it does amplify extreme voices. It reinforces biases. It locks us into certain tribes. So I think a lot of this stuff has to just be courage at a government and economic level. In other words, saying if we're going to destroy democracies by talking about free speech and the right of people to associate on social networks, that's a problem. We need to actually take away the profit motive. We need to actually enforce antitrust regulations. The last big company we broke up was AT&T almost 40 years ago, and they're almost back to their pre-breakup dominance as it is. But in just about every sector, whether it's high tech or pharma or food production, we have uncompetitive monopolies. So social media is just one example of that. You know, you have Facebook, Google, Apple uh, dominating and Amazon dominating the whole tech ecosphere. So we need to actually start breaking up these monopolies for our own good. If we don't, I believe we're in for more division and, and self-destruction. You know, it's interesting in an article by Shoshana Zuboff, who wrote uh, the surveillance capitalism book, and mm-hmm. this is called uh, The Knowledge Coup. She actually writes that, you know, um, any trust won't solve the problem. And she says, imagine that the America of 1911 understood the science of climate change. The court's breakup decision would have addressed Standard Oil's anti competitive practices while ignoring the far more consequential case that the extraction, refining, sale, and use of fossil fuels would destroy the planet. And then she goes on to argue that um, really the issue is data collection. And, you know, if you're, if you're downstream focusing about fact-checking or comment moderation, you know, you're, you're, folk, you're too far down in the weeds. You've got to focus on the collection of information because she argues that just as there are laws against organ harvesting, human organ harvesting, um, that we have an inalienable right to our fears, hopes, dreams, desires, and preferences. And that any no company should be able to build a dossier of that information and then use it against us. Fascinating. I'm trying to get her. We're trying so hard to get her on the show. We haven't been uh, <laughs> uh, lucky enough yet. Well, you're not going to find any arguments from me. You asked for some prescriptions. I definitely think antitrust and things in the common good need to be part of the equation. One of the reasons we have political polarization in this country is in the early 80s, we uncoupled national broadcasters from the need to abide by the fairness doctrine, which basically means you have to give a point counterpoint opposing viewpoints on every issue. And when like that went away, that's lie. when, sorry, you have to give the truth and the lie. Right. Well, OK, that's that that's what it's be become. Right. Yeah. But but you have to at least do that. And once the pretense of that falls off. Then in in the late 80s, you have the rise of things like Fox News, which are just propaganda. They're not actually news. And there's no attempt to give any kind of um, alternative viewpoints. So we did it kind of to ourselves at a government policy level. I think government can do a lot to fix things. But to your point, I think that you're you're right. We can say the genie's out of the bottle, but privacy rights are huge. Europe does a much better job with privacy rights, although even their vaunted GDPR and email protections, that's being enforced by a a committee out of uh, Ireland that has a budget of $30 million. I mean, come on. So part of it's the laws, part of it's the enforcement, and part of it is understanding the, the toxic damage that this is being done and that government needs to step in and correct, quote unquote, in personal market forces. When I think about fairness doctrine, you know, we used to argue ab- about what we should do about the facts. Now we argue about the facts well, or whether facts something all. is a fact. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, you know, it used, it used to be very, I think it was easier to appreciate the difference between journalism and opinion. Right. You know, in a newspaper, there's a separate section. That's the editorial page. And that's the yes. opinion. written by else. different people. The, the opinion editors are different from the newsroom people. They don't but get on, to talk to each other. But on on CNN or on Fox News, you know, there's there. They actually have opinion shows and news shows, but there's no disclosure. 
it's not clear which is which. So, you know, you've got a guy in a suit on the same background telling you his opinions on a Fox News set or an MSNBC set. And, you know, there's there's no way to differentiate that as an opinion from a fact. And so I wonder, here's what I want to ask you, because um, uh, I know that your background uh, also is, is not, it, it's not just um, psychology. It's also electrical engineering and neuroscience. And I know you studied uh, natural language processing. So, so do you think there's any hope that maybe AI solves the problem by making truth a ranking factor in Google or any of the social algorithms? There's what's called AI uh, back in my day, I actually spent seven years in, in the PhD program at UC San Diego working on neural networks, self-learning algorithms, what would now be called AI or deep learning, machine learning. And basically we were working on the algorithms back then in, in the late eighties, but we didn't have as large data sets to train these algorithms on. Obviously that's not a problem. So the internet with its flood of giant data sets has really allowed AI to blossom. But the thing is, all these algorithms are doing are extracting really subtle patterns out of large data sets. And the problem is, what are the data sets that we're using them to train on? So if you're talking about redlining, which we can agree is a social evil, you know, you can't get a in certain zip codes, you can't get a mortgage because it's a minority neighborhood and we're just not going to lend there. Well, if I taught a mortgage scoring algorithm with red line data, it would effectively encode that biased uh, social policy of redlining into it, into its decision making. And you can't open the black box and inspect what's inside. These things are super subtle. No human can do it. So AI, at least running open loop without a human oversight or somebody saying, no, that's messed up as I think also creating new problems and bigger problems. Uh, I think the ethical use of AI requires a kill switch and requires human beings in the loop. So um, I guess as a parting uh, question here, um, if we are, as you say, so heavily influenced by those around us and our cultural norms, is attempting to market to independent thinkers a fool's errand. Well, it depends on the in the our normal nature. What we're wired for as a species is we're definitely influenced by the culture around us. That's it. Full stop. Uh, we're it's a flood of stuff coming into us all the time. We're getting our social norming from that, and we can't avoid that flood of stuff coming into our heads. Now, having said that, you and I belong to this particularly weird. Uh, civilization, which is going to the European civilization, which starting with early Catholicism around 500 AD became what's called weird, you know, Western, independent, all of this stuff. Uh, we're basically less communal than just about any culture on the planet. So part of the cultural soup that we're swimming in is the idea that we're individuals, that our individual happiness matters, that our autonomy matters. So if you're selling inside of that tribe, no, it's fine to sell to individualists. It's just probably not going to work really well in communal um, civilizations. Uh, Asia would be a perfect example. Pretty much all of them are communal civilizations. So don't expect it to carry over. I mean, it might work in Germany as well as the U.S., but don't expect it to work in India. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. I'm sorry. Right. As many as you want. I'm here okay. for you. So, so um you know, you, you've been down this road now for, for a while and, and you've uh, consulted at a high level. And now you're an author and you keynote around the world. Um, what surprises you the most about where we are today? Um, it's just how quickly we've gotten polarized. Um, that's scary. When I came, I was born in the former Soviet Union, came here in the 70s. And, you know, there's political reaching across the aisles. There's grand compromise to save Social Security. And Tip O'Neill, the Democratic House leader, got votes from Republicans and so on. And, and I've just seen the polarization increase and, and people harden into their stances. And um, I, I think what surprised me the most is how durable democracy seemed in the 20th century, or at least post-World War II. Uh, and it turns out that it's actually not that durable at all. In all of these countries from 
Brazil to the U.S. to Turkey to, to Hungary, Poland, we're seeing backsliding. And I don't know that the, uh, you know, we're like we we're talking about the center can only hold if there is common beliefs, if there's at least an agreement on the facts, as you say, that's disappearing. So I don't know that societies can hold together based on uh, diversity and uh, democratic principles. Well, then that's another reason to buy David Pogue's book and read the chapter <laughs> on preparing for societal breakdown. Uh, Tim Ash, CEO at timash.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And if folks want to figure out more about uh, my book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, they can also check that out at primalbrain.com. It's out in ebook, audiobook narrated by me, and very soon paperbacks, April 6th, worldwide. Awesome. Can't wait to read it.